I hope maybe more people will keep coming, but we're a little bit late already, so we'll begin. I'm now the bishop for the Davis County League of Women Voters, and we have been asked to moderate this meeting tonight. We're very happy to see you come. As you are aware, the things the city does are really important to how your life goes, so we're very happy to see people here, and we know that you're the ones who will vote. And we know that also you're probably the ones who will talk to your neighbors about the issues. So congratulations on being an involved citizen. Uh, I would just like to remind you that if you have not voted, you need to register by October the 21st. You can do that online at vote.utah.gov if you have a valid Utah driver's license. Or you can do it in person in Farmington at the Davis County Clerk's Office. And for those of you who are interested in what the candidates spend and who gave them money, you can go online at the same place, you vote.utah.gov at the end of October, which is when the expenditures are due. Uh, please turn off your cell phone so we don't interrupt the meeting. Our format will be that we have two mayoral candidates who are seated up here, and I hope they're where everyone can see, can everyone see okay. We have Terry Palmer, and we have Douglas Peterson, and they are seated alphabetically. However, with only two candidates, the format is going to be that one candidate answer, answers the question first, and most answers will be three minutes unless we cut it down later, a three-minute answer, and then the next person will answer last, but that means the same person who just answered will be answering first for the next question. So Terry, then Doug, then Doug, then Terry, then Terry, then Doug. So with only two, that's how it goes, but it's more fair to have everybody have a chance at giving the first answer because that is usually the prime spot to be when you're answering a question. The questions tonight, uh, which is an unusual format for us, have been okay in advance by both candidates other than the ones you have written. And I have so far uh, several audience questions, but those will be interspersed with the ones that they have okay. I don't know if we'll want to do this or not, but we'll see if we do. If the person who has answered last brings up something that the person who answered first would like to respond to, that person can make a 30-second response. I don't know if they'll want to or not. But if something comes up that they want to react to, they'll need to give the high sign and we'll give them a 30-second response. Uh, our timer is in the front, Marilyn Ober, and she will hold up a sign that says 10, 30 seconds left, then 10 seconds left, then stop. And that's just so we keep it fair that each candidate has about the same time to reply. They may not want three minutes. We're more used to doing two-minute answers. So if you don't feel obligated to take three minutes, but you have up to that if that's what you want to do. And the other thing is I would like no applause until the very end. We don't want it to be a pep rally where Canada supporters are trying to outdo each other with clapping. So none until the very end. And with that, we will begin. Um, and my purpose is not to interrupt anything. So I'll just ask the question, and you know who answers first and who answers second. And if you want a response, let us know. And then we'll start with the next question without interruption. The first question. Yeah. Well, how long is the meeting going to last? I am thinking about an hour and maybe an hour and 15 minutes. We'll see if we're through with everything you wonder before that. So that's approximately how long it will go. Uh, the first question is. So I have a question. <laughs> what? Are we going to do an opening statement? Yeah. That's the first question. <laughs> uh, the first question is their opening statement where they're telling you why they decided to run, what kinds of skills, talents, and experience they have that would make them a good mayor, and if they have the time, they can get into the issues that they think are the most important in this election. 
So we'll start that with Terry, and I won't interrupt. I'll have my back to you for the rest of the meeting. Go ahead. Thank you. I would like to uh, give appreciation to all of you citizens that are here tonight, and also to the Davis County League of Women's Lawyers for, for moderating this tonight. Um, some of the qualifications that I have that will help me in doing this is, first of all, I'm supported by many, many citizens that have come to me and said, hey, we need a change. We need a change in our government here. So I chose by being drafted to be here. I would like to mention also that I've owned a business for 31 years. I've learned to hire. I've learned to fire. I've learned to uh, to work with different people. I spent nine years teaching Dale Carnegie, so I've learned uh, a little bit of stability and how to, uh, to complement and build people with human relations skills. Let me give you a few statistics about Syracuse. Syracuse population at the end of 2012 was 25,112 people. Household median income was $84,450. I like that. Um, the median house in, in the city is 242,000. We have five elementary schools, one high school, and, uh, and one junior high. Clearfield's population, not too different, it's 30,376 in 2012. The household income is 45,640. And the median house is 146,000. I look at those two figures and I think that if you look at Syracuse at the 84,000 median income and the, and the uh, house of 242,000, I think that's a lure for people. That's why a lot of people have moved into this city is because they say, hey, you know, uh, this is a place to live. They have a nice home. They have uh, families. In fact, uh, Syracuse was rated this year is one of the top 10 cities in Utah for rearing children. Only one other city in Davis County received that, and that's Farmington. I think that's a plus. That's telling me that we have done a lot of things in the right direction. Back in 2003, Syracuse, West Point, and Clearfield tried to go together to build a conglomerate called a flex zone or a DTEC. Well, Syracuse residents did not want to lose control of their city council or control of what was being built there. So, Mayor Panucci pulled away. In 2009 10, we found that uh, Mayor Nagel and Enneagram wanted to come in, wanted to flex them. This time, we had a mayor who wanted to push that. I am one of those citizens that fought it, and I will continue to fight that. Good evening, thank you for being here, and thank you to the League of Women Voters. My name is Doug, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and why I decided to run for mayor. Uh, I grew up here in Syracuse and, uh, and raised my family here still, so I've been here my whole life essentially. It's a wonderful place to live, um, regardless of how it has grown, it, it has grown well for the most part. And I still enjoy living here. Uh, even in high school, I had uh, this idea that it would kind of be neat to be on the city council someday and give back to the community that way. And so that was my impetus in running for city council. I've now served for six years on the city council and had no intention initially of being mayor, but um, as I, I started to think about this upcoming uh, election season, I thought there's some things I can offer. And I went in on the very last day that we were able to file for office with about 15 minutes left. And I said, who has filed? And I saw who had filed and I thought, um, there's got to be something in the middle. I felt like there was two ends of the spectrum. Uh, both good people, um, both Terry and the, the current mayor, good people. But I just thought, I'm a moderate voice in the middle. I'm somebody who goes into situations and issues without my mind completely made up and listens to citizens and listens to experts and listens to the other city council members before I make up my decision. And I felt like that that kind of a voice needed to be 
our next mayor. And so, uh, despite the fact that this campaign is not fun, and there's people that uh, hate because you don't agree with them, I decided to throw my hat into, into this and um, try to be that middle ground voice. Having been on the council for six years, I think has given me some tremendous experience in not only knowing the issues, but knowing the staff, knowing uh, fellow council members and mayors in the area, knowing uh, how budgets work, knowing how meetings are, are run or should be run. And so I've had this six year experience now to prepare me for being mayor. So my strengths are my experience and my just middle ground voice that I offer you as, the, as your mayor, and I would appreciate your vote. Thanks. I assume nobody wants to reply to an opening statement. Okay, the next question is, it wasn't long ago before when Syracuse had a $600,000 shortfall. If something happens, that that should happen again, whether it's a natural calamity or both collapses or the economy of the United States just tanks again. Whatever the reason, if Syracuse finds itself without enough income to cover current expenses, what would you do about it? And that's what ch choices does the city have to raise revenue? What are your options? And what is the process you would use to decide what to cut? And third, is there any city service that you would refuse to cut that you think just couldn't go any lower? And this question will start with that. Boy, that's a, a long question, but uh, we have worked hard to turn our budget around. We have gone from having, uh, having to struggle and have shortfalls, which many cities, most cities did, to now being able to have a healthy surplus within the limits that the, the state allows by law. Um, we've done that by a combination of cutting, uh, developing efficiencies and how we get things done, and raising revenues. Our sales tax has gone up tremendously. Um, if it happened again, where we were in a, an economic downturn, there has to be a combination of things. And it's, it, I would not want to cut any services. I wouldn't. I, we've talked about that two, three, four years ago. And which one would you cut? If we talked about cutting the police or fire, people would be up in arms. If we talked about cutting recreation, another group of people would be angry. And so all of our services uh, have a great purpose in the city. One thing that I would never want to cut is our public safety, our police and fire. That needs to be uh, funded and adequately staffed to protect us. Uh, I'm a big believer in recreation and what it does for our community, and we have a large recreation program. We also have a public works department that takes care of our roads and our water lines and all of our infrastructure that would be tough to cut. But equally as tough would be to raise taxes. We haven't done that very much in Syracuse. In fact, only one time uh, in as long as I can remember, and that was prior to me being on the council. In an economic downturn, that would be one of the last things we want to do. So, the question's a tough one, um, and I don't know how to answer it other than this, that we, have, we build a team of people, including the mayor, the council, a wonderful staff, and you as citizens, that are able to sit down and say, where can we make cuts? Where can we increase revenues and get us through these tough times? Because it's not popular to raise taxes and it's not popular to cut services. So we work as a team to make it through, just as we've done over the last few years. Looking at uh, our federal government today, I think there's a very good possibility that we could have a downturn. There are effects from our federal government that actually touch locally. Uh, you go down to Zion's National Park, there's a lot of people out of work there. 
So this is not a fictitious type question here. It's a very light, liable thing that could happen here. Uh, 31 years of owning my business, I've had downturns. I've had situations to where my revenues have changed. Um, the first thing I did was I did not pay myself. That was a very consistent idea. So in answer to your question here, as far as the city is concerned, um, first of all, we need preparation. We need to formulate a plan. In fact, our state representatives and senators have asked us to formulate a contingency plan just, just in case this happens. We need to make sure that we keep our revenues at that 20 to 25 percent of our rainy day fund so that we're prepared for exactly that. I would always look internally to begin with to make sure that we met the needs of the city. There are differences between needs and wants. And I want to make sure that the needs of the citizens are met. That would be the most important thing to do. If it were to ever come even close to raising taxes, I would want to make sure that it was presented to the citizens of the city because that's who we represent. We do not represent um, the state government, the federal government. We don't even represent staff. We represent the citizens. You are the people that we represent. I would present it to you make sure that it got out to you and explain to you if there was any need for any increase in taxes. And that's the only way that I would do it. Otherwise, we would meet the needs of the citizens. Uh, Councilman Peterson talked about the fact that, you know, we need to make sure that the public safety is taken care of. I agree with that. Not just the police department, the fire department, but we need to make sure public works is taken care of. I mean, they provide our water for us. We need to make sure that our water is not contaminated. Thank you. I think there's one important thing I'd like to add, if I can have 30 seconds. We both may alluded to something that you may be interested to know how it works. That's the Rainy Day Fund. The Rainy Day Fund it is not its official title, but it's the best way to explain it. And that is required by state law to be between 5% and 25% of our general our general fund revenue, or our general fund uh, budget. And we got down to that minimum 5% a couple of years ago. And together as a team, as I mentioned before, we've been able to build that up to almost 20% now, so that we're prepared, at least in part, if, if something happens with the economy. Yeah. Do I reply to that? Okay. Sounds good. The next question came from a citizen tonight. It says, the Syracuse City Industrial Ordinance language states that industrial uses are needed and desirable to have within the city and that industrial uses are to further the concepts of sustainable communities and smart growth. Considering that there is only one area in Syracuse that is zoned industrial that has developable land, do you agree with the ordinance language? And if so, where else in the city do you foresee industrial type property? So I assume it's a rezoning question. Well, I probably would disagree with the ordinance to an extent. I think we have some property east of us here on the 1700 South that is a general plan to be industrial. I would uh, consider industrial put you know, by the high school in that area right there or anywhere along the corridor of 1700 South west of here would be very, very inappropriate. Um, I do not want to be considered an industrial city. I want to be considered a, a community or a bedroom community. I like the idea that people move here with the uh, concept of living quietly, enjoying their yards, not being polluted by some industrial uh, facilities that are set up. But there is plenty of area around the Freeport Center. 
that is actually in the part of Syracuse that is uh, pre-zoned to be industrial. Um, like I say, I like the idea of us having an $84,000 median income compared, compared with other cities that may have substantially less than that. The other thing to note here is that along with industrial, a lot of arguments for the industrial is the fact that it would bring jobs, jobs to the city. Um, it would bring jobs, but they are lower income jobs. And possibly they would not be Syracuse citizens who would actually take on those jobs. So personally, I would, I would like to see that ordinance change a little bit and not have that much industrial. Thank you. We do have uh, some industrial zoning that's currently being excavated on, uh, along Highway 193 and between there and 700 South, and that's been uh, some of the contention that uh, has been raised throughout the, the last couple of years here in the city. We also have a little bit of general plan zoning down by the Bluff Road, um, and I cannot foresee the future for that. I don't want to add uh, industrial zoning throughout the city, but in those areas, I think it's, it's, it has its place. But not, I don't have this vision that I think Mr. Palmer has that it's going to be an extension of Freeport Center or smokestacks or, or trucking industries, and although trucks would be involved. I, I see it as being something like Kaysville has. Kaysville is where I work. I pass it every day. I pass the Barnes Park area that has industrial zoning with large homes surrounding it and a park right in the middle of it. And I don't think anybody would drive past there and believe that that was uh, what they would picture as industrial. We have a company that's become uh, a contentious topic or a contentious word in our city, and that's an integrate who's shown us what they've built and work with us to make sure that their, their designs and their plans for where they are building currently um, is going to be something that fits in our city and people are proud of. Now, I don't know a lot about creating jobs, but I know that the state and the county economic development people have come to us and said, this area could create more than a thousand jobs and what will they pay? I don't think they'll be low paying jobs because they have to meet a certain range just to be within what we've created, which is an EDA. It's not take me a whole other five or ten minutes to explain, but we've created an EDA, which is an economic development area to, uh, to be part of the sustainable growth in Syracuse. So I think that kind of industry has a place in Syracuse because it, it creates a tax base, creates a job base, that can look very nice, that can fit into our city, and that can help us over the long run. Um, and that's the kind of thing that I think we need to push for, that I will push for. Not more free course center, not looking to expand into more zones of our city, but to use what we have very wisely as far as industrial goes. In, in response to that, when you talk about Kaysville and their business park, that is not in an industrial area, that is a business park. Uh, along Highway 193, I think a business park would be a great place. There would be great businesses to go there. Uh, that is what it's for, but it's not for industrial. Thank you. Uh, let me follow that up with another question that we got from the audience tonight, and the question is, I, I hope I'm getting this right. In an industrial area, what's the process you're going to use to listen to citizen input rather than just choose a developer and landowner and say that's fine? So the question is the process of bringing the citizens into that kind of decision. What process would you use? Is that me first? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think we've already demonstrated that process. Uh, first of all, there was part of the question that I asked about choosing the developer. I don't believe that's our job. I believe in property rights and people who, who own land have the right to develop it 
in accordance with the city's plan and the city's ordinances. Um, in the case that we have up there by near the high school on Highway 193, um, this has been a long process and it's been one that has involved citizens. In fact, there's been a, a concession of 40 acres by the company there that by Minigret who have allowed homes to be built now and, and Ivory Homes will be building a subdivision of single family homes because every time that uh, there was talk about multifamily dwellings, citizens didn't like that. When there was talk about uh, bigger buildings being across the street from homes along 700 or along 2000 West, people didn't like that. And so I think citizens have had a wonderful chance for their voices to be heard. Does it make everybody happy? No. And I, in my six years of being on the council, I don't, I don't found something that does make everybody happy. But um, I, I think we've gone through that process. We've tried to respect the property rights of a landowner, but we try to respect the property rights of citizens who live around that area. And so the process, I think, just needs to continue. It doesn't have. Nobody wants government to be bureaucratic, but we don't have to be fast either. We can take our time to get it right. Um, when we talk about the process involved here, this past Tuesday night, we had an interesting uh, thing that came up. Apparently there's 20 acres around 4,000 west and 1,200 south that they want to bring into the city. And it has kind of been pre-zoned to be a PRD or a private residential development. Um, unfortunately, the process is not working properly here. Um, the citizens need to be notified approximately within 30 days of any changes. The citizens didn't even know anything that was going on until they actually looked at what is what was on the agenda for Tuesday night. I do believe that the process needs to be better. The citizens need to know what's going on, what zoning changes may happen, what is going to be built next to them. I talked to a gentleman tonight that was concerned about the industrial development that's going on over by the high school that they want to have going on. I think that letters ought to go out to all the citizens around that development to let them know there's a potential eight houses or eight uh, structures per acre, which is pretty high density in housing in an area where most homes are half acres, even acres in that area. So the process has been uh, significantly not applicable to the citizens who has been more than the staff. So I guess I, I will just say one more thing on that. Um, Mr. Palmer alluded to before something called DTEC. This was a plan to develop the area between Highway 193 and 700 South several years ago. And its weakness, in my opinion, was that it was not very well communicated with citizens and that it wasn't, uh, there wasn't a great planning process that involved citizens. I think we remedied that and I think we involve citizens more now, and that's important. In response to that, uh, DTEC was loss of control of the city council and giving control to the developers, and it did not change when it came to the new project for Hand Grant. It did not change. Okay, the next question, I think we start with Terry. Is that right? Okay, the next question is, what is the biggest issue facing Syracuse over your term of office, which would be the next four years, and how would you solve it? Well, um, we've already talked about what I thought is the biggest issue in that zone. But I'll talk about the second biggest issue that's coming out here, that is secondary water. <coughs> in this city, secondary water is precious. Very important to us is the fact that we love our green lawns. Yet at the same time, we have limited water. So the tendency for government is to control the citizens. 
as long as we as citizens understand that there will always be that pressure from the government to have control and pressure from the citizens to have our freedom. There's got to be a good balance there. But more importantly, I think it needs to actually be more to the citizens to give them their independence and freedom. And until we as citizens have proven that we cannot handle our freedom, <coughs> then I think that we should have that. In our last uh, debate, I mentioned that Councilman Peterson is for metering Secretary Water. He told me he's not. He told us that he's not. So I decided to do a little checking on this. And so on 6-25-2013 in the work session, this was a conversation that happened between it within the council. Doug said, I don't think we are doing enough as a council with water. The water issues are just piling up, and I don't think they are going to go away. Bob Rice, the city manager, said, they are getting worse. Brian Duncan, so you're willing to spend $600,000? Councilman Peterson said, it's all across the board. I'm willing to put the, ra the radio meters in for $600,000. Yes. Brian Duncan, not me. Councilman Peterson said, it's not an increase to the citizens. It's only going to help the citizens. Then the mayor says, it's a long-term step to Congress conservation. In this conversation right here, it's obvious that Councilman Peterson is in favor of radio meters. I spend the 600000 to a million two. I think we need to prove that we are, that we cannot handle our freedoms. This past year, in a tough year, we stayed within the 75% of a lot of water that was given to us on secondary water. So I say, as long as we're meeting our, our uh, requirements, leave us our freedoms. Thank you. <coughs> uh, well, I want to answer the question, and then I want to address the, the conversation that Mr. Palmer just had. Um, first of all, I don't want to be a mayor that runs on a one-issue platform. So I, I can't tell you what's the most important issue. Because over the past six years, as a councilman, there's been dozens and dozens of issues that have come up that we've had to tackle. I think I could name three that are going to be very important in the next, three, in the next four years. First of all is economic development, being able to have sustainable growth, business growth, uh, job growth here in our city that makes it so that we as citizens don't pay any more as in taxes. And the second thing I would say is our services. We need to make sure that our police and our fire and our recreation, our parks, and our public works, our, our services that everybody can be proud of, everybody uh, can have what they need from those things. Um, there's some work that needs to be done in the public, in the public safety sector. We need more police officers over the next four years and we've got to look to how we're going to fund that. And then the third thing I would say is our infrastructure. And that's where roads come in. We've been able to do $7 million worth of infrastructure work over the past two years. Um, being able to pull from different funds where those monies can come from legally and being able to do roads and water lines. And those have been important for us to do. And we need to continue to do that. We need to take care of our roads. The roads that you've seen that we've replaced this summer are very expensive, but we can maintain our roads for, for pennies on the dollar compared to having to replace them. So economic development, our city services, and our infrastructure, I think three things that are huge. One of those is water. Um, and I'm going to stand by what I said, and that is I don't know if I want to meter secondary water. The conversation that has been referred to in the notes here was about culinary water and re slowly being able to replace the old meters that we have currently with radio read meters that would actually let you as citizens be able to get on your computer
computer, your smartphone, and know how much water you're using because you pay by the gallon, um, up to up to eight thousand gallons. So, and then you pay over the you go on beyond that. So, that's what that conversation is referring to. And I could say that in that meeting because we had listened to staff who had told us how much it would cost, who had told us how we could pay for it, and who had showed us the benefits. We haven't seen that yet for secondary water. And so I don't have an opinion about secondary water metering other than I do believe that it's our job as city council and mayor to help conserve those precious resources. Might, might I respond there? Um, first of all, I, I am a one issue person, and that issue is our freedom and our liberty. So, so as long as you understand that, that is the most important thing to me because I represent our freedoms. Six hundred thousand dollars for radio metering to replace a thirty thousand dollar a year person that reads them take twenty years to replace that. By that time. Those meters would be outdated, pretty expensive. Uh, there's many more factors in it, and I think that's the job of the mayor and city council is to look at all the factors that go into to doing something like that and weigh the pros and cons, and uh, not just be scared away because something costs money. Sometimes, if you spend money, it can make things better in our city. Doesn't, I'm not saying that I'm a big money spender. I think I'm very conservative fiscally. But you have to look at those things as a mayor and city council and be able to know the pros and cons before you spend money. And the next question starts with Doug, I think. Am I right? I think so. Okay. And you, you have both said something about this already. So the question is if you just have something to add to what you've already said. What are the strengths you see in the public safety departments in Syracuse? And what are the unmet needs in public safety? Okay. The first thing that I would talk about is our police. And uh, I, I spend time, my goal is to once a month go to one of our departments. And so that brings me to the police department or the fire department about twice a year to spend time there and see what's going on. So I feel like I have a good grasp. Um, and plus our chiefs for both of our departments are very good at being here at city council meetings and, and keeping us up on the issues. So one of the things that is concerning for me is that our, our police chief has laid out before us that the industry standard for police officers is to have one officer per 1,000 residents. That is putting us close to 26 officers. We currently have 19. Now the argument could be made that maybe Syracuse doesn't need, maybe it's not as dangerous of a place and that we don't need 26, but certainly 19 seems low to me. And our police chief has come to us and said, over the next couple of years, I feel like we need to add four officers. And we're going to add one this year. And we probably needed to add two because we're just going to keep falling behind. Um, that costs money, and our police officers have been able to go out and get a grant to help pay for, for the additional officer we'll have. But, so that's concerning, our staffing. The last time I was at the police station was in August, and we had uh, two officers working in the evidence room, some place that they hadn't had time to clean up all summer, and they needed to clean and organize and file. Uh, while I was visiting with them in the evidence room, another officer came in on his day off because he worked the night shift and never had a break to do paperwork. He'd, he'd answer call after call after call because he was the only officer on duty. And so he was there on his morning off with no sleep to do the paperwork involved with all those calls he'd been on. So I think that's important that we staff our police department better. But the fire department and the police department, we need to make sure that they have training, that we pay them adequately to compare, not to beat, but to compare with other cities around us so that they're not leaving our city after being trained and going to other cities. And we need to give them the tools to do their job. Um, and that, that ranges from firefighting tools to, uh, to police vehicles to, uh, to 
is supporting our canine unit. The list can go on and on. But we need to give them tools and training and retain them and, and take care of them. This is something that uh, the public safety people are something that we all benefit from, whether directly or indirectly. When it comes to our uh, public safety, I believe we have an excellent police chief and also fire chief. They are, they are great people. I've talked with both of them. I talked with uh, Chief Adkin about meeting with the police officers. And he talked with the attorney and said, hey, you know, during the council, or since you're not a member of the council, and it's uh, election time, it's best that we don't do it at this point in time. So I'm OK with that. I do, or I am aware that he is interested in more officers. To look at the standards of um, one police officer per thousand members uh, of citizens, you know, you're comparing cities that have a lot of crime, and you're talking about cities that may not have that much crime. What you have to do is you have to look at your city. You have to look at what the needs are within the city. I'm not saying that we don't need more police officers because I personally believe we do. But to actually look at a standard that is put out by other places. For example, the Vision Utah says you got to have 15% of your community in a moderate income housing. Um, I, I just hate other organizations telling us what we have to do. When a city, the citizens per unit interest may be more expensive housing, like maybe uh, Cottonwood Heights. You know, can you imagine building 600 apartments in Cottonwood Heights? So, so when you take a look at standards that are put out by an organization that tells you you have to do this, I disagree with that. But at the same time, let's look at our needs, look at what uh, our police officers have to go through. And if they're having to come in on their days off, then that's, that's certainly an issue. And I've talked with Chief Atkin. I, I personally believe that we need more police officers in the city, but not because some outside organization is telling us to do that. Um, I, I think along this line here, personally, I've had an opportunity to ride in an ambulance to the hospital of uh, this city. And I was at the back. So I know that the professionalism and the uh, training and so forth that our uh, fire department and our police department, it's tops. It's tops. Um, they knew exactly my problem, which I didn't. And so it's pretty cool that they are professional trained and they need more training. Thank you. I'll just respond. Um, even our good chief did not say that we have to meet the industry standard, but he put that out there so we understood what it was. And, and then he put these numbers out there, which I think will startle you because I think we live in a safe community, but there's things that go on uh, that we don't know about. In 2012, the police had 7,821 incidences that they responded to within our city. That's up by 1,200 incidences since 2010, yet we still have had 19 police officers throughout all of that. So we need to make sure that we have police protection here in our city. The next question is, and this was submitted by more than one person in the audience tonight in different words. But what are your plans to help civility prevail in the city? Share an example of how you personally have learned to resolve conflict in the past. Okay. <laughs> I think uh, the lack of civility is created by lack of trust. I think in our council and mayor there has been no trust at all between, between the two. This is something that I've learned that when trust is high, speed is 
high and costs are low. But when you have low trust, then speed is low and costs are very high. And that's what's happening in this city right now. There is there is lack of efficiency and all of that. So we, we need to build trust. And uh, I'll give you some examples of some things that I've done in the past. Uh, I taught for Del Carnegie. And in Del Carnegie, they set up a, a group of six or seven people and they learn to start with one on the right and they compliment that person, the first person here. And they go around and they give compliments. Those compliments are based on qualities that they've noticed about that person. What's interesting is when you start looking at a person on a positive basis, then all of once you start learning trust. I personally would bring you into this city training, not just training on their jobs and their ability to do their jobs, but training on their ability to work with the citizens, work with each other, so that they would learn to always look at the positive side instead of the negative side. So those are some examples. I would work civility. I talked with uh, Mike Daly earlier tonight. As, as we chatted a little bit, he leaned over to me and says, you know what, I think we're pretty close. You and I can work a lot together. Personally, I believe I can work with Doug. I can work with most people. If you talk to my employees, all 11 of them, and ask them how it is to work for me, they would tell you that I'm a good boss. Thank you. Well, let's see an example. Turn to God and say something positive. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I can tell you, Doug, that uh, you would be an excellent teacher because you have the ability to communicate very well and you do have control of your thoughts and emotions. Thank you very much. Let's see it come back. You bet. <laughs> uh, you know what? Terry is an excellent father and I know that because I grew up with some of his kids and saw the way they the way they uh, handled themselves and, and was friends with their daughter. So I don't know that Terry's an excellent father. Um, well, she was pretty good. But <laughs> <laughs> what will I do to uh, be able to kind of get rid of the negativity? Well, I think that I come in to this job as mayor with no agenda, no personal agenda, other than just to do what's right for the city. Um, I don't take the disagreements personally. I, uh, we can debate things and that's just fine. I don't take it personally. And I try, try to treat others with respect and that includes members of the council and, and our staff and our citizens. And as I mentioned before, one of my goals is to try to build a team of all those people that work together and trust each other. Um, as far as an example, I, I can give you a hundred. That's what I deal with every day examples of conflict as an assistant principal uh, and I'll just give you one that's happened over the past couple of weeks that I think illustrates uh, some of the, the, the tools that I have to, to deal with conflict as mayor. We had a parent come in a couple weeks ago to talk to, to wanted to talk to somebody and fell to my desk and he was furious. He'd had something happen with his son and he was mad at the world. He was mad at me. He was mad at the teachers. He was mad at the school. He was mad at the school system and the school district. And the first thing I did was listen. I just listened and let him get things off of his chest. I could have argued with him. I could have told him he was wrong on some of the things he was said. I, I let him talk. After he got that out, um, the next thing I did was I tried to problem solve using not my, just not my knowledge, but using a team. I told him to answer one of his concerns. We were going to go together and talk to one of the teachers. To answer another concern, we were going to talk to a counselor. To answer another concern, we were going to call somebody at the district and address his concerns using my team of people that are the experts. Um, the next thing that, that we did was get 
his son involved to, to see what is your is your version of this problem and what how do you think we can solve it? We worked together to solve it, and then after he left my office and after he we visited with his other people, I followed up with him, and we've stayed in contact over the past couple weeks to make sure that his issues were getting resolved. Those are the kind of tools that I think I can bring to being mayor. To pulling a team together, listening to people that have issues, and then following up to make sure things are done and done right. Okay, the next question starts with Doug, and this is a question about the West Davis Corridor. Farmer City has taken a stand against the UDOT plan and in favor of the shared solution. Tell me to what degree you think Syracuse City should be involved in the decision for the West Davis Corridor. That's tough because there were two things on the table, uh, two parts of the corridor going through our city, one that went out farther west and took out some farmland and some homes, one that now uh, is being considered as the preferred route to go down Bluff Road and take out some homes and a little bit of our park and, and have an impact on the Syracuse Arts Academy. So it's, a, it's not a win-win for anybody, it's just terrible. You know, we experienced this when Adam Drive was widened years ago, about three years ago, and my wife's grandmother lived on that road, and she, her home was taken as part of that growth, so it's not easy. And so uh, I think we've, we've vetted this as a city, and I think the job that we can do now that's most important is communication, and be a channel for communication between UDOT and the citizens to be able to uh, just make sure that citizens are being heard and UDOT information is being provided in a timely manner. Uh, as mayor, I would want to step back from this, this fight or this argument because somebody in our city is going to lose no matter what, and that's unfortunate. So I think we're just going to be a conduit for information. Yes, this is a very tough question. This morning I took my wife to the airport about 5.30. There happened to be a, a truck that had tipped over off the highway. I'm sure that there were people who were way late for work and I'm sure there were a few people who missed the uh, flight. My wife has to, happens to be somebody who checks ahead and I was able to get out of legacy. We had a choice. Right now, there's not a choice up here in the north, so the need for the West Davis Corridor is there. Uh, like Doug, no, nobody wins in this game. The sad part to me is that people's front doors are going to be looking at a freeway. That is disgusting. You know, uh, I would rather be taken out than to have to, to walk out my front door see a, a four-lane freeway in front. I mean, that's really hard to, to handle. So it is not a win deal. However, it is not a decision that that we make. UDOT makes that decision. But I would tell you this, I agree with Doug on this issue, is that uh, we need to make sure that we get the information out. And then on top of that, we need to make sure that the effects of the West End's corridor is less and what it's looking like it will be. And to me, let's take those homes out instead of, I mean, that's what they want. Instead of, instead of walking out the front door, I think they would rather see their homes taken out. So that's where I'm at. Well, let me ask a 30-second follow-up then. Since neither of you talked about the shared solution, do you think that's not a viable alternative? Um, uh, I'm going to be honest, I think that the process is probably beyond that by now and very close to having a decision and an approval made. And I know there's some things now in the, in the process that might throw a wrench into it and then it might come back to the city's table to, to chime in. But as of now, I think that uh, it's in somebody else's hands. I would agree with that. There's. There's no ability on our part to uh, change anything that's happening there. Okay, we're going to 
switch to one minute answers just so I can get a little stab at some other questions that people want to answer. Uh, the first question is, you think there are enough parks in Syracuse? If not, what would you do to expand parks? And would you add a dog park? And I'm not sure where we are, Terry. Well, now, there, there are not enough parks. Um, first of all, we had a park over by Jensen, 60 acres we sold on, and it's discussing that we lost our eight baseball diamonds that we could have had there. Our city council voted that, so we sold it for 1.9 million. I hope we'll take that 1.9 million and go out and find another park where we can have our baseball fields and that we can have uh, good soccer facilities so people come into this city. We're wanting people to come in here. We want them to spend money at, at our various uh, Arby's, McDonald's, Wendy's, all of these different places. So, and I plan on finishing Chloe's playground. All right. Um, yeah, we, we are in the process of selling some land um, from Jensen Park, and we will because we have to and because I want to and I think the rest of the council does to go out and buy more land and uh, what I would like to see is a regional park so we can't have those softball diamonds, those those soccer fields that not only have I had residents tell me they want but I believe would bring residents in from other cities to spend their money here and their time here. Um, as far as the dog park, I, I don't envision building something that would be just a dog park, but to be part of one of our parks, I absolutely believe that. And then the last thing I'll mention is, is Chloe's Park out here that has been one of the things that I've been passionate about to have this park that's going to be unique to the Western United States, nothing like it, west of St. Louis, and we'll be able to have it right here in our backyard and again bring people from all around the state, maybe even the Western United States to use it. Okay, the next question also, one minute. What value does the City Recreation Department bring to the community? Um, I spent two years in my master's degree studying this. Um, I got a master's degree in health, physical education, and recreation. And it brings huge value for people of all ages. And it brings value even if you don't personally use the recreation facilities or programs because it, it provides for a safer, healthier, more well-rounded well community. And we have an awesome recreation program. For cities our size, we have the second biggest junior jazz program. We have uh, wonderful football teams and, and all these things for youth. We have some great things for seniors, but I'd like to see us be able to expand our offerings for adults, because we need to play too. We need to enjoy life and we need to be healthier as adults. And so I'd like to see those offerings for adults be expanded. Let me say, Creston does an excellent job in our recreation department here. We do have super good football going on here, and it's well attended. Our junior jazz, as mentioned, is, is one of the best in the state. Um, there is a great thing that comes out of the recreation program that builds character in these boys and girls. Uh, with the soccer and things like that, it helps them become more focused on accomplishing and it gives them a competitive spirit so you can, can't put money on that. The next question is also a one minute answer. The city invested in fuel efficient vehicles with the idea of saving money in the future. When does the city break even on this program? Was it a good program? Why or why not? I have no idea, so that's not a very good question for me. Um, I'll try to answer in one minute. Uh, you guys, this this program to this program to have vehicles sort of accomplished a couple of big things. The fuel efficiency is one because most of the vehicles we we recently got are hybrid vehicles. We also put in our own fueling station, which means that we can purchase the fuel wholesale and and have it for cheaper here within the city. But the other thing it did was that we had budgeted, or the city had budgeted for years to purchase three police vehicles a year. 
and that would give it give a rollover that would be adequate to maintaining those. We got behind because of the economic downturn, and that's one of the services that we did cut was purchasing those vehicles. So the opportunity came to lease vehicles for the same price that we had been purchasing three a year. We were able to lease ten vehicles. At the end of that lease period, we'll be able to purchase those vehicles for a dollar and be able to a dollar each and be able to continue to use them. So the answer would be better for our finance guy, but but about three years is the payoff to those. Uh, the next question will take more than a minute, so let's go back to a three minute, but we're probably drawing to a close here pretty quick. This question is about the city budget. What are the main expenses in Syracuse, and what are the main revenue sources? Um, the main revenue sources are sales tax, property tax. Um, that's where we get most of our revenue, and so because we both told you that we don't want to raise property taxes, we need to make sure we do things to bolster our sales tax. And we've talked about economic development tonight, supporting our businesses that are here, as well as bringing in new businesses. Um, the the biggest expenses we've also hit on some of those, and those are the services we offer. The expenses that come out of our general fund budget are police and fire. Um, part of the recreation program. Some of that's covered by the fee people pay, but some of it we pay for. The administration, some of the public works, and um, those are all services that we uh, that we have that, we, that come out of those sales tax and property tax revenues. Um, we need to make sure those are balanced. We don't have the luxury of the, of the federal government in being able to spend more than we take in. Each and every year, as a city council and as a staff and as mayor, we sit down and we break apart the budget line by line and make sure that we are living within our means and the money we bring in is the money, is what we're spending on these services. And so uh, I think that's a great strength I bring to the mayoral position is that I've spent six budget sessions, six budget seasons as a councilman learning how that works and learning where cuts can be made, where efficiencies can be realized and where we can do better at, with our revenues. And so if you vote for me, I think you're getting that strength in the budget and uh, somebody, I don't want to raise taxes, I want to let development help take the burden off of us as individuals. I, I do believe that we, we bring in just under $7 million a year into the city. Uh, we have committed a million of that every, every year to pay our, our uh, mortgages and bonds. About 72 to 73 percent of our money goes towards salaries. Uh, we do have commitments within the city. We need to make sure that we, we replace infrastructure at the proper times. We do receive in road funds from the state, and we need to make sure that we add to that so that we can continue improving our roads here within the city. Uh, we have fees that come in on our uh, water bills and so forth that need to be targeted for the utilities and the public works and make sure that it's spent there. Within the city, you have to spend your money in the different categories. You don't want to get out of those categories and you can be in trouble with the state. So it's very important that we uh, be efficient with our money and make sure that, uh, that we meet the needs of the city first and then move forward. I will. I, I love our rent department, and that is a great place to spend money because it builds adults out of children. Thank you. Can I have a thirty second on this one? Mm -hmm. Just to add a couple other things. Um, really, what what we talked about, what I talked about, was the general fund. Um, we also have some important funds, that, which are utility fees. That's what you pay in your utility bill. And then we have impact fees. That's what developers and home builders um, pay when they build here. Um, those things, as Terry said, are categorized. You have to spend them for what you took them in for. 
But those are important revenues and expenditures for us to watch as a city council and mayor because we don't, we cannot, nor do we want to make money on those things. We want to be able to charge residents exactly what we're spending. And might I add to that, that since you brought up impact fees, uh, our impact fees are a little bit higher than most cities, but one of the reasons for that is the fact that they pay for the secondary water, the hookups and all that stuff, so there is an extra expenditure in those impact fees. Okay, we will give you a chance both now to summarize, and this is a chance to correct anything you think might have been misunderstood or add anything we should have asked, but we didn't ask, so answer your own question if you think there's something you should have been asked but weren't. And this is your chance to give your pitch as to why people should vote for you. So I think we're talk, starting with Terry again. Okay. This, is, this is three minutes. Three minutes. <clears throat> you know, when it comes to decisions made in a city, I've learned over many, many years, don't panic. Don't make rash decisions. When it comes to the development along 193, I would say, let's not make quick decisions. Let's take a look. Let's look at the alternatives. I've had opportunities to wear a landmark piece of property and I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to wait until the proper thing comes by. I believe that if we look at what Syracuse is today and what it could be if we made the wrong decisions, I think we have to look at that. So it was our decision to have the biggest population in Davis County. I mean, do we want 50,000 people here? Do we want 100,000 people? Maybe we could even hit 150,000. I don't think that's our goal. I think our goal is quality of living for the citizens that are here and a lure for those who want to enjoy that same. Over the years that uh, I've owned my business, I've made decisions every day that have affected hundreds and hundreds of people. I'm a decision maker. I'm firm when I make those decisions. Every time somebody walks through the door of my work, they have a problem. Every time they walk through the door here at City Hall, they have a problem. They want to solve it. Many times, it's just a little problem. They want to pay their water bill, whatever it may be. But sometimes it's a big problem, and you need to be a problem solver, and that's what I am. I also have a time to be mayor. I'm willing to put forth all the effort and all the time that is necessary to do that job. In other words, my business is running very well because I hired the right person at the right time, and I know how to do that. <clears throat> Last of all, I would like to let you know that I have the proper ideology. That ideology is that you, the citizens, you're my employer. I don't work for Syracuse City. I work for you as citizens. And I will look at you as citizens at any major decision that we make. Thank you very much for this evening. I appreciate you all being here. Thank you. Um, one, one thing that we've been asked before, and I would love to address it as part of this closing statement, is um, how do we retain employees? We've had several uh, employees leave, and it's not always about money, but I want to be, be able to be the mayor that builds a team that keeps employees here, that keeps employees uh, here in Syracuse working for their entire careers um, by, by giving them trust and respect and tools to do their job. And uh, those employees um, are an important part of the team that I've talked about tonight. Now, so many of the, the things that Terry brought up in his closing statement, I would echo as being my, the same qualities and values that I have. Uh, I, can, I can solve problems. I can reach out to people. 
Uh, I reached out to Terry in order to get this night put together um, and worked with my opponent of all people, but we can work together in, this, in our city and I can bring that, those qualities that allow us to work together. In addition, I would add what I've said tonight already is that I bring experience. I know how city government should work and I think I recognize the things that could, we could be doing better within our city. I've been here my whole life and I think it's been a great place to live and I want to continue to see it grow, no, not to 100,000 or 150,000 people, but as it does grow, I want to see it grow right, and I want to continue to be a part of that as your mayor, and so I would request and appreciate your vote, and just add to that, that early voting starts on October 22nd, you can come here to City Hall to, to cast your ballot during city hours, or you can go to the Community Center on Election Day, which is November 5th. So thank you very much for being here and for your support and vote. Okay, that's the end. So please join me in thanking both candidates with a round of applause.